But I don't think that's too bad at all. These are all these are all goose fat and duck fat ones. So if you're a vegetarian, avoid like the plague. There are vegetarian ones on the the wider list as well. If you want to have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. What about the sweet treats? Because for me, it's not Christmas without a mince pie. Well, you know, the sweet treats are becoming more elaborate and I think Marks and Spencers were a lot to do with that. Everything became quite decorative. It suddenly became about the centrepiece. I'm a little confused because if you've got Christmas pudding and mince pies and puddings, do you really need it all as well? You know, maybe mm. it's a time just to streamline a little yeah, bit. Perhaps. But if you do want that sweet treat instead, uh, we've got mince pies coming out best. I'm very pleased to say this from Betty's. No, Betty's. Oh, Yorkshire Betty's. You can buy them online nationally, though. 15 and then... quid for... 15 quid for, for 12, 12. I know. It's a lot of money, it's a big, big, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big spend on Betty. Uh, budget dessert, we've got Asda's Extra Special Millionaire's Cake, which, again, is quite decorative. It's a, a whole feature. And uh, we've got Little Deluxe uh, Luxury All Over Ice Christmas Cake as well, at 6 99 for a kilogram. Now, those two, the Asda and Little one, they're quite big as well, so you're going to get quite a few portions out of that. Well, if you do, if you are a Christmas cake eater, it costs you a lot more than 6 99 to make one. Well, are you going to make one for me? Well, we Stephen? normally make one. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah, we normally make a Christmas cake, but they cost a lot more than six ninety nine. Do you not start now? Uh, oh, you've got to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, it's it's the enjoyment, though, isn't it? Well, I, well, I don't know. I mean, it's just when you look <laughs> well, don't at the, when, do it, when, then. when you look at the price of that. <laughs> anyway, let's talk Christmas pudding. Yeah, so we brought in our taste tester. Here is my <laughs> glamorous <laughs> assistant. <laughs> I don't know about that, but the there you go. Debbie McGee to the Paul Daniels <laughs> in my life. As people will remember he was absolutely blown away, so blown away by the, the budget ketchup that yeah. he fell off his stool. Did you, yeah. you went viral <laughs> for that, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, so we're going to try some, do it again. some Christmas pudding. So, just to prove the point, I've brought in three Christmas puddings. So, thank you in advance for tasting it if you don't like them. Stephen's ready to go with I'm the not, I'm not a Christmas pudding I'm kind of gal, so I don't want any. So, what, what? Right, so we're going to go A, B, C. So if you want to take so, a chunk so, of A... So, so before we begin, though, yes. so, so, so this looks the better one. Right. This looks familiar, right. the way it breaks down together. This one looks cheap, so right. that's okay. my... OK. But why, why do you think that looks the better one? No, it's lovely and round and not glossy. Yes, exactly. But it's, it's a bit glossiness. dry to me. Mm. Yeah, but it, well, looks, it, looks, it looks natural. Oh. Um, OK, I'm and put it down for buzzers, right, so. Chris. OK. So when you like it or dislike it, give us a buzz. So, so is this an A? What's what Chris having? You, is Chris, Chris having A or B? No. Chris, is he's got on C. He's just breaking the rules. Are you having any... Oh, what am I breaking the rules? What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? Right, you're having C. Oh, no, 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 I've not touched it yet. Right, have some A. Have okay, some A. OK, Keep OK, OK. Stephen, Chris. what do you think of A so far? A, um, it's all right. It's a bit just normal. OK. Mm, it's warm. At least it's warm. warm. Well, no, well, what, you what, can't what, what, test what? the warm. Green or red? Oh. Oh. oh, you cancelled each like other me? out, I so did. that's... Oh, well, no, I didn't know which one was it, which. It's green is, you like it, red is... Oh, OK. It's a bit, it's a bit boring. Let's get yeah. on to the one you think looks um, aesthetically appealing, then. Oh, yeah. Oh, that does look nice. Yeah. I have to say, that does look... I'm sorry there's no cream or custard. Exactly, going, guys. exactly. Yeah. That's what's what said to... Brandy what butter. Say. I think that looks dry. Yeah, but it's nice. Much better than that one. Is it? I think so. Yeah. So that's got... So, as far as the two... Does it taste moist, Stephen? It does taste moist. Yeah, it tastes nice. Oh, OK. B got a big thumbs up. A got a B's big thumbs well. down. So where are we going with C? It's got a slightly different flavour, that one. Yeah. Does it? this meet in the middle, though? That looks like mm. the two combined to me. Mm. Like, like so let's go number. for C. C, all right. <laughs> so this is C. I've got this on, on a plate, right, really. OK. Right. Oh, Stephen, that's a mouthful. <laughs> probably needed some water as well in between. Like swilling, like a sommelier and you're wine testing. Hmm. Oh, quite nice. Yeah. I've got my favourite already. Have you? And you I've both got like... my favourite. I think it's this one. Yeah, me too, me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too, Steve. OK, right, come on then, mm. Kate. Oh, I failed. Isabel, I failed completely. What, they like the Dales? They like the one. really expensive Dales for Christmas. Oh! oh, 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 oh. So, but what was your second favourite? The, that, Let me that. go. For this? Yeah. Well, I feel a little bit better then, because that was Tesco's. Right. Uh, and Tesco's was £8. Just to give you an idea as well, I, I, this was over £20. The price isn't on here, but quid. 25 And this was Waitrose, which was £12. So you've right. helped me a little so bit. So how much was the Tesco one? This was £8. Right. £8. Well, it's much better than the Waitrose one, and much yeah. bigger. So we can get rid of that one. Yeah. It's between these two. But I think it's, do you want to spend £8 or £25, then? Oh, but it? in terms of that, then, 
Well, the Waitrose one beat it in their it test. It did. In their taste testing, the Waitrose came out top. You voted that last. Yeah. But then we're oh, between the price of the eight that's and the five. I think that, that, that would look out in the stomach a little bit better. So, can you, where can you... Because, obviously, they have their, their shop. It's the Bamfords, isn't it? The JCB family that yes. own Dalesford. Oh, exactly. I've never heard of them. Well, yeah, you can yeah. buy Dalesford in Waitrose. So, you can buy online. a Dalesford... Yeah, okay. through the stores okay. as well. And they do an online offering as well. And it's a beautiful store experience. It's a beautiful brand. There's no, there's no uh, challenge to that. I yeah. think it's just the price, isn't it? Yeah. Twenty-five yeah. pounds. Yeah, I have to say, I thought that was beautiful, but yes. I, I wouldn't pay twenty-five pounds. Well, Christmas well done, Mrs. Bamford, but we might have to stick to. Yeah, Christmas I reckon she didn't cook Tesco, it. Tesco, anyway. yeah, it's Tesco for me out of all that lot. Then, in terms of value for money. Yeah, I might, I might push the boat out and go for that because I'm the only one who eats anyway. Oh, there you go, big thumbs up. <laughs> Fantastic, guys, yeah. really enjoyed that. You thanks for having me. Time. No, 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 because it was excellent. I'll was... get him next time. <laughs> That's not <laughs> sinister. Oh, oh, oh. I'm just having a little dose of insulin now to make up for the. Um, okay. Oh, so, look after you yourself. So I don't mm. go. The, 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 through the roof. Very Kate nice, Castle. Thank you. Thank Chris, you I can so much. You don't need to go anywhere. You can just swap I'm off. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very you. much Bye. indeed. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we're going to take a quick break after that. As I say, Chris will be here and he'll be joined by Dawn for the papers. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, we have a simple plan, which is to inform, stimulate and entertain in equal measure. It's all about getting your opinions on the national television airwaves. I love my viewer emails, mark at gbnews.uk. So do join me every Friday, Saturday and Sunday for big guests, big opinions and a big presenter. Six foot five, don't you know? See you then on GB News. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel.
go through the papers? Oh, well, yeah, if you want. I'm quite nice. I'm having that... <laughs> Food like, coma. Well, it's like that after Christmas dinner where you just want to lie down on the sofa. <laughs> right, then. <laughs> don't worry, Dawn now. and I will sort this out. We've got the former <laughs> editor of the Daily Star, Don Neeson, and Chris Ackerbys, I don't know if you're feeling in a food coma. I'm feeling great. Um, <laughs> <all right. laughs> Before Dawn feels too left I'm out... I'm feeling cancelled. Oh, sweetheart, <laughs> we just thought you didn't look like somebody that indulged in Christmas what pudding. You can ask supermodel <laughs> you that you are. You I'm don't sorry. Like Christmas pudding, though, do no, you? I know, but that's <laughs> the thing. There, it's nice to be oh, asked. Darling. <laughs> Next time we'll have you for the if taste you, test. If you're doing chocolate Santas, you're there. I'm there. All right. All right. Mm. Uh, let's talk, shall we, about uh, the NHS. What Sir Keir Starmer had to say about it, Dawn? This in the Telegraph. Right. This yes. Absolutely. Well, it's, 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 it's actually Keir Starmer trying to lay to rest many of the perceptions people have about Labour and the migration policy. He gave an interview. Is it up in Scotland? And he was saying that foreign staff are not the answer to the NHS crisis. As we know, the nurses have announced they are going to go on strike um, for the first time in a 150-year-old history of the Royal College of Nursing, I believe. Um, and Keir Starmer was given an interview saying that what we've got to stop doing is relying so much on our um, foreign staff and actually start training people more. And one of Labour's pledges is to uh, take on an extra 7,500 medical students on an annual basis from the UK to fill the, the vacancies. I mean, vacancies all over the country um, in the NHS on all levels of jobs as well. So I think he's actually trying to... Because everyone seems to think that, you know, Labour have this open border policy. And Kirsten was saying, no, we don't have an open border policy. Well, he's trying to appeal to the centre ground, isn't he? Is, of course he's he is. He's on election footing. He is on election footing. That's exactly what he's trying to do. But he is saying, no, we don't have an open border policy. That's not what we're about. We need to invest more in UK talent in, in all areas. But so... what's interesting with this, though, is he's accused that while doing all this, he's accused the government of having sticking plaster policies for nursing... But yet his own scheme isn't going to solve the problem for several it's, years. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I mean, look, no one can solve this problem overnight. I think we all admit that is the case. And as you say, Stephen, it's quite clearly electioneering. But, I mean, we, we seem to have this blur now between the two parties where mm. some of the policies that the Conservatives are coming out with sound distinctly like Labour and now Keir Starmer talking here of sounding more Conservative. So I, I think, you know, this, this general election, whenever we stagger around to it, it's going to be, uh, who are we meant to vote for? Yeah. Mm. But a lot of confusion. Ooh, to play for. Um, Chris, you want to talk about phone banks? And we yeah. were talking about data poverty this morning mm. and exactly what that means. Mm. But I suppose it's increasingly important, isn't it, for people to have access to data? Yeah, and I think this is actually a good news story. Um, Virgin O2 have got a pilot scheme and they want to give access to data for a anybody 18 plus who's low income and has no reliable access. Now before the avalanche happens, um, they get 20, gig 20 gigabytes of free data a month for six months. And I could very well imagine this being important saviour to some people. Um, we know we're in, in lockdown, there were some families who didn't have a computer between them yeah. and couldn't have access. So I, I do think this is a good, million, a good, a good story. Um, two, apparently there are two million households who would fall under this uh, um, metric. Mm. and are struggling to afford reliable access. So, um, well done. And there's also another thing... Well, that I'll tell you what, this is interesting, because it's about commercialism, though, in all of this, because when we were talking to the boss of, of Virgin Media O2 about this earlier on. This is, a, this is a PR stunt, in effect, to try and increase traffic and increase business. But this is where... PR stunts and commercialism actually do mm. benefit mm. people. Yeah, OK. So, I mean, you know, to, fair play to them mm. for doing it right. in, that, in that sense. You just hope other ones follow on soon. Yeah, so I didn't pick up on that. And, 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 and but like you said, if there is a, a real uh, material benefit on the ground, then mm. good luck with your PR. Yeah, yeah ex well, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah, my you should think about it if you're doing that. Why not? Yeah. Um, Dawn, we're all getting fatter. Uh, and now, according to the Speak Daily for Star, <laughs> aren't we all, we're, we're all having to um, increase heights on the gymnastic bars, and now they're testing uh, gymnastic dummies. Bars. Yeah, no, technical those term. A lot. I was watching the World Championships. And I haven't on at all picked this story because some of you have been eating chocolate, uh, <laughs> eating Christmas pudding all morning, and I haven't. <laughs> um, any case, this is in the Daily Star, and it's the crash test dummies that we use to seat belts and airbags in cars. Uh, the European New Car Assessment Programme are upping the weight limit for the dummies, which are currently uh, at 15 stone, to 19 and a half stone, because we are all getting fatter.
Um, 28 per cent of adults in England are obese at the moment, and that's uh, not, not, not being improved in any way, shape, or form. So now they are going to use 19 and a half stone dummies. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, and, but the, the thing that... It, it, I know, it's depressing. But the thing with this story, Isabel, in particular, is they used male dummies, OK? They're all men. Now, how many women drive? How do you know... What? ..that they're male dummies? Because they're the right size, shall we say, Stephen? Oh, they haven't got any... I mean, I don't know, I think... They're just, they're just human-shaped, aren't because they? Because they say, Stephen, they say that they are made for an average adult male. Yeah. There you go. They right. might put a little bit on. I don't know. I've never looked. Have you looked? No, they don't put any bit on. No, you do. Are you sure? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Quite sure. Any case, so but women are suffering because safety aspects in cars, Isabel, blanking you, um, are designed for men. So right, like fat well, men at that. I have to say, a lot of girls complain about seatbelts and yeah. boobs being a problem. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Um, lots of women, a lot of women pull out yeah. their seatbelt because it's uncomfortable yeah. to have it. Mind you, a lot of men have bigger boobs than we do now. Also, well. when you're <laughs> pregnant, but when you're pregnant as well, seatbelts can be really yeah. uncomfortable. So, you know, yeah. anyway. But men can get pregnant now as well. But so we're all they? getting fatter is the headline from that. And I love their headline, <laughs> spare tyres. Yeah, I know. It's very good, very good. Is it not? Is it just about... Because I was looking at a picture, and I don't know if it's true or just a model, but isn't it about the shape? They made them, fat, like, physically fatter? Uh, slightly, yeah. Because yeah. isn't it that more about how you bend and all the rest? of it is going to be... And, and plus, it's the, it's the airbags, the, the actual uh, um, impact that an airbag needs to be able to take, so mm. it's not just the size, it is actually the weight of the dummy as well. Uh, mm. Who knew we could talk about crash test dummies for that length of time, <laughs> including their little bits? And get so worked up about the gender of a crash test yeah. dummy. Come on, come on. <laughs> this is where gender Gender's really important there. these days, Stephen. Yeah. I'll have you know. <laughs> Let the dummies be what they want to be. <laughs> then they can self-identify. My, my philosophy. <laughs> do what they want. <laughs> Um, uh, military homes in The Guardian, Chris. Yeah. And there's, I mean, this is uh, shocking, actually. That, I mean, some of the housing provided for the military is actually mm. pretty rotten. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my first mode quarter, when I reflected, it was absolutely bang out of order, thin plane, pane windows, no um, draft exclusions. Basically, a third of military homes are still in bad shape despite £650, £650 million pound repair contracts. And it's juxtaposed with all the money the various suppliers are actually taking in dividends and benefits with the state of the homes. There's 40, uh, circa 48,000 service family accommodation and one third of them have got leaky roofs, broken doors um, and, and are rotting. Um, there's a... Quote from a, a sail serving sailor's wife who says she's lived with leaks and rots for two and a half years. There's a lack of coordination between the company, company taking reports and the one doing the repairs. And then when you go into the article, you see this series of relationships between the person who's got the contract and then the subcontractor is delivering mm. and they are not delivering. You, you know, what I find really upsetting about this particular story is the fact that we are all making such a fuss, rightly so, about Manston and the processing centre being a yeah, poor state, not fit for purpose. And yet this story is buried away in one paper mm. and we don't seem to, you know, yeah. treat military families and how many veterans do we have sleeping rough as well is another yeah. link to this yeah. story. Yeah. We don't seem to treat them and no-one seems to care or make a fuss yeah. about it. It's what, very important to you, it. So what happens in our country is that, like, for example, when we had the COVID scenario, we glorified our NHS. And when we had the Falklands, we glorified a military. So until a military conflict comes along, Not a lot of the challenges yeah. Yeah, yeah. that go on in the military are unrepresented. But you, the, it, it, so they said an Englishman's home is a castle. Forget Lincoln a bit, but we all need our home, our safety, security, and your place mm -hmm. to belong. And our military personnel have got one third of them have got inadequate safety, security, and a place to belong. Mm. Yeah. yeah, shocking. Uh, very Absolutely fair shocking. point. Yeah. Um, Dawn, should we talk about dogs? Battersea Yay! Dogs, of course, really famous. Um, but there is a flawed law that they are trying to highlight and they want changed. And what does it mean? Yeah, well, absolutely. Four legged friends. It is, absolutely. So, I mean, I, try, I promised to find you a nice animal story, Isabel. I fell miserably. This is about actually putting them to sleep, unfortunately. Mm. Um, basically, it's, it's the Dangerous Dog Act, which identifies breeds simply by looking at them. 
And Battersea, amongst other animal charities, want the law changed because it, it's implying that, mm. you know, that it, just identifying a dog by sight alone doesn't necessarily make it a dangerous dog. And, and Battersea is saying we, we have to put these dogs to sleep by law um, because they are... Well, there's nothing aggressive about them. But there's nothing aggressive. They're deemed to be dangerous dogs just because they look like a dangerous mm. dog. And they, they, they're citing a case here where even dogs from the same litter... Some aren't deemed to be dangerous dogs because they don't, they, they don't look like the breed and others do look like the breed. I mean, pit bulls in common, so they're the ones that put down. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It doesn't so you make can any see, sense. No, it doesn't. But they're saying well, there needs to be treat the dogs according to their nature rather yeah. than the breed. And, and let's be honest here, it's not the dogs most of the time, it's the people yeah. that own them. Yeah, yeah. I, had a, I had a beautiful, I mean, passed away now, but I had a beautiful uh, Doberman, not Doberman, I had a Doberman as well, as she, she was Roxy, but Zen was my Rottweiler. Yeah. Now, Zen is just, he was just a beautiful, quiet, reserved dog. Mm. And now you could put him down because it looks like they call him a dangerous dog, yeah. but he, he was far from dangerous. Yeah. Roxy, well, she's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. Yeah. But so, you know, so I agree with you, you know, you, you, you can't just because of the breed say, let's put that one you down. You can't, yeah. but the issue of dog safety, I think this year, more than any I can remember, has to be looked at, doesn't it? There have been so many fatal dog attacks, including of children this year. I think it's on average at least one yeah, a but month. Is, but you have to ask the, the question of the owners for rather sure, than for the sure. dogs. But it's and the, the thing, topic that I don't think is talked no, about no, enough. No, you're, you're right. Yeah. And the thing is, Isabel, since the Dangerous Dog Act was actually introduced in this country and pit bulls are the most common ones, um, there have been an increase in attacks. Right. Mm. So it doesn't seem to be helping the situation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm with you on that. I think it's down to the owners yeah. a lot of the time and mm. how they're handled. So put the owner down, then. Steady on, steady on. Controversial. Chris, can I just... Because we were hoping to go to the, to the National uh, Memorial Arboretum, but we can't get the line-up at the minute. So can I talk to you about Remembrance? Mm -hmm. Because Remembrance Week, and, there's a lot, and, and the Royal British Legion are putting a lot of things on this week, it's hugely important, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's important that we have this display at the Arboretum, which is opening today. It's important that we've got the Festival of Remembrance at the Royal Albert Hall with the King on Saturday, mm. Cenotaph on Sunday. And as a veteran, yeah. what does it mean to you to see this being marked yeah. and remembered? Yeah, great question, Steve. So, um, I joined the Army in 1975, left in 1990. And when I come to this week, I think of the young men that I, I served with in the late 70s, Billy Langdon, uh, Alfie Birch, Johnny Standen, and these were young, we were all young, all young, vibrant guys, give and take. And in, in 1982, the Falklands happened. Mm. <clears throat> now, none of the guys that you mentioned, as far as I'm aware, got... Uh, you know, dis disarmed, sorry, got disabled for the, for the Falklands, but so, so many people did. Mm. So, for me, when I think of the 11th of the 11th, I think of those young soldiers, mm. how bright, how young, how vibrant, and yet how committed we were to the cause. I remember getting called up to go to the Falklands, 82, on a parade square, st standard operation of PG-7, which means you're locked in camp, download your weapons and get your dog tag, which has got all your details on it. And I had to phone up my missus to tell her I wasn't coming home. Yeah. On Monday, they called us back on, onto, onto the barracks and we, the 1st Battalion, Prince of Orange Regiment of Yorkshire, that's who I was attached to, we were not selected to go, the, the, the Scottish Guards went, because we were too young. But we could have gone and I would have gone. Mm. I called my missus, I didn't want to go, but my sense of duty mm. meant I would have gone. So I could have been blown to Smith and Fiends, I would yeah. never have run, I would never come been to my country. So that's what I think of. I think of all those young, vibrant yeah. men and women mm. who commit, well, it's a quit the king now, to serve the king and country and will do so and will lay down their life, pay the ultimate sacrifice mm. so that we have peace and security in our I mean, nation. Did you know what? I was at the, um, the, the Christmas mess do last year with, with my other half and Lance mm -hmm. Corporal Dixon said to me, and, and, and it gets, start off, you know what they're like, they start off very formal, everyone's in mess dress yes, and all the rest yeah. of it and then it all goes a bit wild. Yes. And everyone was going wild, having a great time, very drunk. Yes. And Lance Corporal Dixon said to me, um, if you look around this room, if there was a major conflict, you know, 30% of this lot would be, know, it'd be dead. Yep, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. At least 30%. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it was just that 
cold moment for me with it. And there they are, all having fun, Absolutely. all young. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean, Steve. Yeah. That's exactly, so, you know, you know what they're like, you know, that, yeah. that's all. Do you think there's an extra poignancy this year, though, Dawn, with everything that's happening in Ukraine? We've got war in Europe mm. as we face 11-11. There are men and, indeed, women fighting for freedom as we speak. Mm. And, and, you know, do you think there is an extra sort of element to all of this? I, I think there is. I think I agree with, with everything Chris and Stephen have just said. I mean, there is, there should be a poignancy every year around this. And I think it's so easy these days to over-politicise it and almost say that if you are wearing a poppy or you're attending a remembrance um, service, that you are somehow supporting war. Mm. It's not about supporting war. It is about supporting every generation yeah. going back mm. who have been willing to give their lives so that we can live free and in a democracy. And I think that's so often forgotten, especially maybe by younger generations that mm. have lived mm. war-free up until yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so I, I just think it's important to remember everybody going back over the, over the, the decades that yeah. have been willing to give their yeah. all. And that's such yes. a, a, a moving story, looking oh. around a room of people that, you know, 30% would never come home. Oh, mm. yes. mm. Lest we forget, as they say, at Dawn yes. Neeson, Chris Akabusi. You've been a delight. Thank you. Thank as you always. Both. Thank you. Uh, look, don't go anywhere. All the top stories and we're hearing from Labour and Conservative politicians in a couple of minutes. Thanks, Guy. Looking ahead to today's weather and the UK is looking windy and rather cloudy with outbreaks of showery rain, especially in the west. Let's take a look at the details. So a mostly cloudy start in the southwest of England with strong, gusty, southwesterly winds. There'll be blustery showers which may merge into longer spells of rain at times. Showery, locally heavy rain will lie across the southeast this morning where it will be mostly cloudy and there will be a strong southwesterly wind. A windy start across Wales, especially around the coasts, and it will be rather cloudy with locally heavy showers or longer spells of rain there. And it will be a mild and mostly cloudy start across the Midlands with little change in the weather throughout the morning. There will also be some scattered, locally heavy showers and rather breezy there too. It will be mostly cloudy with outbreaks of locally heavy showery rain, especially in the west, and there will be some brighter spells in the east, but it will be mild and breezy for all. And a breezy morning for Scotland, rather cloudy, but with some brighter spells in the east, and there will also be showery outbreaks of rain. These will be mostly in the west. But a mild and mostly cloudy start in the north of Ireland, with little change in the weather throughout the morning. There will also be some scattered, locally heavy showers and rather breezy too. So, in summary, remaining mostly cloudy with further spells of showery rain, winds will increase with gales along western coasts, and that is how your weather is shaping up this Monday morning. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Join me, Nana Akwe, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. 
It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's on it today. Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun. Every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon from 4 p.m. on GB News. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain. I'm not afraid to give you a platform and say it how it is. Come on, make the case. Something like this is very, very important to people. And we're always up for a laugh on this show. God, honestly, you'd think there were no problems in the world. Real Britain, every Saturday on GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Rishi Sunak urges world leaders to push for clean growth as he arrives at COP27. Good morning. It's nine o'clock on Monday, the 7th of November. This is Breakfast on GB News with Stephen and Isabel. Let's have a look at the headlines for you this morning. And Rishi Sunak will use a speech at COP27 in Egypt to tell world leaders that the fight against climate change can become a global mission for clean growth. In his first foreign trip as Prime Minister, he'll also hold talks with the French President Emmanuel Macron. It comes as UK negotiators back talks on the issue of climate reparations which are being discussed at the conference. The move opens the door to the government paying damages to countries hit hardest by global warming. And brace yourselves, Andrew Pearce is going to be with us before the end of the show with a look at the top stories making the political headlines this morning. So that should be interesting. Mm, and as always, we'd love to hear <laughs> your thoughts as we've been getting them thick and fast, haven't we, throughout the course of the morning. Uh, lots of people talking about uh, mental health because, of course, Prince William, just in the last hour, mm. has released this big uh, mental health drive along with Harry Kane, uh, head of the World Cup. People saying, uh, it's about to say, it's not such a bad thing that today's kids start to worry about the cost of living. Oh, sorry, this is in relation yes, to the cost of living. Cost of uh, some of today's children are so entitled they see it as somebody else's problem where their designer trainers and branded sports tops come from. Billy and Airdrie says, can we stop treating children like mini adults? Let them be children. I well, kind of agree. They'll soon get to grips with the mess we've made when they are ready for it. I disagree with that. Let them be little because for a bit. Because otherwise the world comes as a blooming big yeah, there's a, shock yeah, yeah, there's an when age. they go to uni or get yeah, a, their yeah, first job or whatever sure. it is. They've got to ease, you can ease them into it. Ease them into Anyway, what do you think? GBVs, gbnews.uk. So our top story this hour, and Rishi Sunak will tell world leaders assembled in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, for COP27 that the fight against climate change can be turned into a global mission for new jobs and clean growth. Now, the PM is also expected to hold meetings with French President Emmanuel Macron, where, you would hope at least, the issue of migrants crossing the Channel will be discussed. Well, let's bring in our political correspondent, Tom Harwood, who joins us in the studio. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you. Um, look, what do you think is going to come out of COP27 when there are lots of question marks about what the UK not only achieved in terms of commitments last year at COP26, but also mm. what we've actually done in fulfilling our own 
promises? Is it all just a bit of a talking shop now? Well, that's the criticism. Now, people who were behind the United Kingdom's presidency of COP, which was handed over formally to the Egyptians yesterday, they would say, well, before COP26, held in Glasgow this time last year, about 30% of the global economy had committed to what's called net zero, that phrase that we now know so well. By the end of COP26, over 90% of the global economy had committed to net zero. So that's a, a win that the UK sort of banks, because, of course, there's no point in just one country committing yeah. to net zero if everyone else does it. We know that the UK is only 1% of global emissions. So if the Chinas and the Americas of this world don't get on board too, it's fruitless. So that was counted as a win from the UK's part. But this COP27 is about trying to hold people's feet to the fire, trying to implement what people have promised to do. And that's the big thing, because it's very easy to say words, to sign treaties, to agree things. But the question is, will you then follow through with action? Mm. And but that's what a lot of this is about. But does that actually, by the very nature of it, seem utterly ridiculous? that you hold a COP meeting and then a year later you have to hold another COP meeting to make mm. sure they did what they promised in the last COP meeting. Yes, it's funny. Well, of course, there have been 27 COP meetings. It stands for Congress of the Parties. And what are the parties to? The original UN agreement on dealing with climate change way back in the 1990s. These weren't originally very high-key yeah. affairs. British prime ministers didn't ordinarily go to them. The, in fact, it was only Gordon Brown who went once. David Cameron went once, uh, and Boris Johnson went once. Now Rishi Sunak is going yeah. uh, as well, but it's not every single year that ordinarily British Prime Ministers go. 2015 was a bit of a turning point. That was the Paris Agreement, mm. and that agreed that there would be a, sort of a, a, a f every five years a, a, a big step forward. Glasgow was that five-year step forward, and the thing about Glasgow is they agreed what was called a ratchet mechanism, whereby every year they would have to come back with more ambitious pledges, and, and that's why we're sort of getting into this... Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, well, the ambitious pledges this time around... I mean, Rishi Sunak, in one, in one sense, is learning the power of spin when he's talking about, well, this could be a global move towards more jobs and, and sort of cleaner growth. Green growth, which, yeah. which we can see the positive out of that, can't we? Growth and jobs, good yep. thing. But he's also said, we'll be announcing today, so we understand, 200 million quid of our money going to help green technologies in poorer countries. Mm. That's going to go down very badly with, and, with people here at home. And we heard it yesterday from the Shadow Climate Change Secretary, Ed Miliband, who said that Labour Party supports what's called loss and damage. Now, to you and me, we might call that reparations. Mm. There's, crucially, this year at COP27, on the order paper, if you like, on the agenda, loss and damage has been uh, added as one of the things that they will talk about, discuss and probably agree something on. And what does that mean? Richer countries sending money to poorer countries to deal with the effects of climate change. Now, big contention as to what counts as poorer countries, what counts as developing countries. Are we going to be sending money to China to help them deal with climate change? And what a farce would that be? Are we going to be sending money to some countries that actually are doing rather well or growing rather strong? That would be a very worrying thing. But, of course, the United Kingdom is one of the richest countries in the world. We will be a net contributor to whatever loss and damage agreement is agreed. And that's one of the big worries out of this, that perhaps it won't be talking so much about limiting CO2 and more about sending money to places that might be affected at by the, climate change. At a change. time when, you know, a significant amount of the population are on their knees. Certainly, and that's the big, hard political sell. It's interesting that the one big bilateral meeting on the sidelines of COP27 that we've been briefed is going to happen isn't about any of the big polluters in the world. It's with Emmanuel Macron. Clearly, they're not going to be talking about climate. Uh, France is actually doing rather well on climate. They, of course, invested in a lot of nuclear power stations in the 70s. 70% 70 mm. of their electricity comes from zero-carbon nuclear, if only we'd have made similar decisions back then. But clearly, this will be a discussion between... Sunak and Macron, the first time the two have met in their respective positions, focusing on the migrant crisis, because Rishi Sunak knows that's what people care about most here at home. Yeah, and look, we've been talking a little bit this morning in the programme about whether or not, you know, just in terms of personalities, those two actually might work quite well together compared, say, with Liz Truss, who said that she didn't know if France was friend or foe. I mean, mm -hmm. many ways, they're both technocrats, they're pretty slick operators, independently wealthy. Um, perhaps unpopular with some wings of the country. Um, they've, got that in, that, they've got that in common. I think if we're going to follow what uh, uh, some might have described in recent uh, weeks as the politics of vibes, vibes. how things Good seem vibes. rather oh. than how things actually are. Oh, Rishi modern. Sunak 
doesn't seem to be sort of a country bumpkin or a, or a, 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 a nationalist conservative or uh, someone who perhaps voted Brexit, even though he did. By many people, he's mm. perceived to be more liberal, more metropolitan, more internationalist. He's a guy who lived in California. And perhaps that mindset, that vibe, if you will, will mesh better with other leaders who are of a similar uh, background. And, and, and perhaps that's the beginning of a relationship there that could work with Macron in a way that Macron was not well disposed towards Liz Truss or yeah. Boris Johnson. And how long do we think he'll be in Sharm el Sheikh? Because I know that obviously it goes on all week, mm. but the, the leaders tend to fly in and fly out pretty swiftly. And we've obviously got a lot to plan for ahead of the autumn statement next Thursday. So I understand that he will actually be leaving this evening. Right, he'll okay. be staying for precisely one day, which is interesting because this is a day that Joe Biden isn't at COP27, for example. So there will be some world leaders that he misses. But yes, going in, doing the bare minimum to show face, give a speech, have a meeting, and then fly off. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, th th I mean that is something positive out of it in the sense that you know, he said he was too busy to go, too much to handle, and now he's gone. Well, you if he's only there for a day, perhaps he can talk himself out of any trouble with that. You do wonder if it all could have been done on Zoom, though, because the number of private jets that will have been uh, mm. Zooming over there to the Gulf and back. Yeah, well, that was yeah. definitely Greta Thunberg's view in all this. Oh. Can we have a quick word about Gavin Williamson before mm. we move on? Um, he is, of course, famous for making bad, bad headlines for now three successive prime ministers. He's got no portfolio in the Cabinet. I don't really know what his role <laughs> is. And yet he's been outed for, for using what's quite frankly, and he's described it himself as terrible language, unacceptable mm. language, towards the whip at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're led to believe that Rishi Sunak knew about bullying allegations and still promoted him back into the Cabinet. Yes, so Rishi Sunak says that he knew of a complaint against Gavin Williamson but didn't know of the specificity of that complaint. And he says that now that the texts have been made public, uh, using quite foul language and some might say threatening language towards the then chief, bad, Whit are, Wendy Morton. This is the point. I wonder, I wonder if, uh, of course, in the heat of the moment, people will use bad language. But the question is, is there a, a power dynamic here? Is there a, a threat there? And some people might say, well, ultimately, Gavin Williamson was not a bad chief whip. He was quite an efficient chief whip. Probably more of the, the party was more united under uh, his whipping See than his anyone techniques. else. And, and perhaps, <laughs> perhaps that's because he was willing to be uh, pretty forthright mm. and pretty, frankly, nasty, mm. which is what traditionally the whip's office has been. And one of the big criticisms of Wendy Morton as chief whip was that she was a bit too timid, perhaps, in that role. Mm. Um, However, perhaps time has moved on and the whipping structures aren't like they were in the 1980s. This isn't about hiding the bodies for people. It's about a more pastoral role. And perhaps Gavin Williamson leant back into the sort of House of Cards version Fair of enough. it all. But, uh, yeah, clearly questions to be answered there. And we're seeing in the front pages of some of the papers this morning some more sure. stories about Gavin Williamson and his time of chief whip coming out. Yeah. Okay, hey, well, stay where you are, because uh, we've you. got some political interviews coming. You might want yes. to stick around. Yes, uh, let's kick off then, should we, with the Shadow International Trade Secretary, Nick Thomas-Simmons, who joins us now. Good morning to you. Um, well, look at, let's, let's have a look at COP to begin with, mm. should we, and this reparation issue which has come forward, and it looks like the UK could be forking out £200 million that we, frankly, haven't got at the moment. What do you make of that? Well, firstly, very good morning and good to join you. And the agenda we're talking about here is that of loss and damage. And we're talking about countries around the world that whatever mitigations they make, whatever adjustments they make, will suffer loss as a consequence of climate change. I think of Pakistan, which recently, of course, has had 30% of its territory underwater. Island states that are low-lying, susceptible to rising sea levels like the Maldives. But it isn't just about morally helping particular countries. There's a real self-interest to this as well. It's in our interests that countries around the world are energy secure, that the whole world energy market is less vulnerable to shocks, such as, for example, happened with Vladimir Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. It's in our interests that we prevent people becoming from refugees and ensure they stay in their homes in the first place. And it's also in our interest, and I say this as the International Trade Secretary, 
to ensure that it is the case that we are building our global reputation, which can only be a good thing for our trade policy and trade opportunities going forward. Yes, but there are questions, are there not, about where and who would be included in these loss and damage payments? I mean, I know Ed Miliband yesterday at pains to reassure people that it wouldn't include China, but can we be certain that that wouldn't be the case? Can we be certain that it would be only countries that don't do harm to our interests? Well, it wouldn't be about giving money to China, as Ed Miliband made clear yesterday. The kind of countries we are talking about are those with particular vulnerabilities and particular issues. Now, I do think, as Ed set out yesterday, that there is a moral responsibility to help those countries. But it is also the case, as I've indicated, that it is very much in our self-interest as a country to be doing this as well. Uh, Andrew's been in touch this morning. He says we shouldn't be giving money and helping other countries if we can't help our own first. Where's the responsibility in terms of... I mean, on the basis that you're moving on to election footing now, which is pretty clear from Sir Keir Starmer, um, what, what would you say to Andrew when he says, actually, your focus needs to be on helping people here in the country rather than anywhere else? Well, the loss and damage agenda is also helpful to people across the country, as I've pointed out. It's important in terms of energy security around the world. It's important well, in preventing people from the, becoming refugees. It's important in terms of our reputation around the world. But these but things are not me, forgive, mutually exclusive, no, for, uh, for, forgive Stephen. Me, that, it is also the case... Forgive me, that's like arguing that trickle-down economics works, isn't it? No, no, it's not about uh, trickle-down economics. It's a completely different idea that I'm talking about. It's about Britain leading on the world stage and leading in the next industrial revolution, which would be a green industrial revolution. But it is also the case. We have a situation here in the United Kingdom, an acute cost of living crisis, a crisis made in Downing Street where working people are paying the price. We've also put out arguments, for example, in terms of extending the windfall tax, where companies are making tens of billions of pounds in profits, and the government has only eventually, Rishi Sunak eventually introduced a minimal form of the windfall tax, and looks like it needs to be dragged kicking and screaming to do the right thing again. But the Tory crisis that is made here in this country is the priority of the Labour Party, and the loss and damage agenda at COP is also in our country's interest as well. Well, we understand that may well be extended, that windfall tax, uh, a week on Thursday during that autumn statement. Of course, we can't uh, preview that yet, as we don't know, but presumably, as you say, you will welcome that. Um, look, we have to leave it there. We are out of time. Um, really good to get your thoughts. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Nick thomas Simon, uh, Shadow International Trade Secretary. Thank you. And coming up, we're going to be talking to the Business Secretary, Grant Chaps. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. 
On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Welcome back. It's 20 past nine. The business secretary, Grant Shapps, is to announce the UK's first large-scale merchant lithium refinery during a visit to Teesside today. And of course, all that happening as the PM attends the COP27 climate summit in Egypt, where he'll make a speech calling for glee, green, clean, green growth. <laughs> Easy for me to say. Grant Shapps joins us now. Morning to you. Good to see you this morning. Um, talking of COP, before we talk about what's happening where you are. What, what's your assessment of the, the reparation which is going to be announced, so we understand? Hundreds of millions of pounds going from our exchequer to, to other countries to improve their, their green economy. Is now the right time for that? I was, I was going to say, um, that makes it sound like we'll be paying uh, all that money. In, in fact, um, the world is coming together and agreeing how to take forward um, the biggest challenge we all face, which is if we don't sort out climate change, well, we've seen the impact on the weather here, uh, let alone around the world. It has impacts on all of us. So uh, it's important we do sort that out. And globally, there needs to be an agreement to do that. It wouldn't be the United Kingdom on our own paying for that. But we were one of the first world, uh, first countries in the world to industrialize. I'm here in the Northeast, uh, which has uh, many of the refineries, including the one you were just talking about, uh, shortly to be built on lithium. Um, so, you know, we did get to industrialize and not worry about uh, climate change because we didn't know about it at the time. The world needs to come together to make sure that other countries can, um, can also uh, benefit from industrialization without destroying the planet. And can you rule out that countries that, you know, openly, like China, would potentially do us harm or could do covertly? One of the things that's really important, I think, and I, I think this is business secretary, I'm also in, in charge of energy and, and climate, actually, is it's really important that we have that energy independence, energy sovereignty, if you like, mm -hmm. so that when you see a Russia withdrawing you know, from the world, attacking its neighbor, and us unable to rely on their supply of energy, in fact, not want their supply of energy, given it would essentially pay for their war, uh, we need to have that independence. And we're lucky in this country to have a better mix than probably any other European country. We've got the world's most wind power, for example, offshore, uh, uh, particularly around our, well, around our coast, particularly where I am actually in the Northeast. Um, so, you know, th that mix is really important. Um, and we don't want to be reliant on other countries, whether that's Russia or China, uh, we want a proper mix. Can you imagine the fury there's going to be at the ballot box 
it, whenever the next election happens, if we're giving hundreds of millions of pounds away on, on this green agenda, when there's no guarantee we're going to keep the triple lock? Or can you guarantee the triple lock for pensioners? Yeah. So, I mean, you only have to wait till the uh, 17th, which is the autumn statement for the Chancellor's full range of packages. I think everyone recognises that, you know, battered by COVID and with a war in Ukraine, um, which has, you know, cost dearly because of the higher energy prices, that freedom isn't free. You know, there is a cost to uh, having a free society uh, and, 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 and being on the side of, 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 of the righteous, in a sense, because you won't stand by and watch a European country be invaded. Now, the British government, uh, this government, has put billions of pounds, 30 billion pounds, into supporting people uh, to keep the electricity and the gas bills as low as possible this winter. Uh, and that support is, is ongoing. It doesn't mean it's not painful uh, in the process. Um, and to your wider question, look, it's, it, there needs to be global agreement on making sure we don't end up in a position where the world suffers because of climate change in a way that would make living on this planet um, impossible for, for so many of us. So that, you know, th there are many challenges. Sometimes you have to tackle more than one at the same time. I'm afraid that that is the position the world finds itself in. Um, you were talking about your, your many hats and, and portfolios within the Cabinet. Uh, what exactly is the role of Gavin Williamson? Why has the Prime Minister uh, promoted him in spite of hearing about allegations of bullying? Now that we've seen that in black and white, uh, he doesn't seem like a very nice character and I'm not entirely clear what it is he does. Well, it's not very edifying. I agree with you to see the uh, that, to see that exchange. Uh, we don't know whether we've seen the whole exchange or, or not. That's why uh, there's a process ongoing looking into it now. On his actual role, um, minister without portfolio, there's, there's often a minister, but well, there's always a minister without portfolio. In fact, I've held that position in the past, and it means uh, you take on a number of different um, roles for the government within the cabinet office. So it tends to be coordination type roles. Um, Gavin Williamson, uh, it was wrong to send those messages, and clearly it was wrong to send those messages. He has apologised, um, and this process will get to the, to, to the bottom of it all, because uh, we, we don't know if we've got the full picture yet, but that's what this process will show us. Oh, oh, go on. I was just gonna... I'm going to say, we're out of time. Uh, I'm sorry, Isabel's lost her talk back, yeah. so she's not hearing the people yelling at her. Grant Shapps, it's good <laughs> to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very we've much. Just, we've just got 45 seconds yeah. to talk to Andrew Pearce, who's here in the studio. What did you make of that, Andrew? Uh, well, no, no guarantee on the triple lock, yeah. which is not good if you're a pensioner. Uh, they went back, back down in it last year. And as for reparations uh, for climate change damage, how are you going to quantify what share British taxpayers have got to pay for flooding in Pakistan, which was related to the Industrial Revolution? You're going on about Industrial Revolution. It's brought great benefits around the world. We should be lauded and praised for the Industrial Revolution. But as per usual, British taxpayers are going to be lumbered with a huge bill for stuff that's going in other countries and how they quantify it and how much it's going to cost is beyond me. But we just can't be seen at the moment. I mean, just with the, you know, your, your general electorate, whatever party they vote for, we can't be seen to be throwing millions and millions of pounds at other countries while we're struggling just to manage over well, here. Well, I would cut the international aid budget even more. It's currently 11 billion. I would cut it in half. I would use the international aid budget for when there is a genuine crisis. If there is flooding in Pakistan, send some aid money. But we're gonna, this, this is going to outrage people watching because we are going to be picking up a bill for climate change problems in the, in, 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 in the third world because it's our fault. Why is it our fault? What about China? What about India? Churning all that stuff out. Uh, and just a yes or no, Gavin Williamson, worth all the bother? No. <laughs> Good stuff. Read my piece in the mail today about him. He's not a very nice man. Mm, yeah. There you go. Like Andrew, Andrew thank, you. thank you so much. Um, right, that we is go. it. Yeah, we're back tomorrow morning, six o'clock. Up next, Tom Harwood, who's still sitting here, has got your <laughs> briefing, so don't go anywhere.